Um, so morning, everyone. Um, I'm Fawaz Ghali. I'm the head of the Report Relations at Hazelcast. Uh, for this session, um, all I wanted is kind of give you an overview how you can take your normal or standalone microservice application and scale it. Uh, essentially, what we want to focus on today is um, deployment for high-performance real-time microservices. So, have you seen it on the screen here? There are a couple of keywords on the screen. So there is a real time, there is the high performance of Goyasli, and the stream processing as well. So um, I came from Liverpool from the UK, and every time I mention stream processing, um, you know, some people assume that's basically we're talking about music streaming or TV streaming, uh, which is fine. It's part of what stream processing is. Uh, but essentially, it's a wide area. You, you've seen it everywhere, basically, even if you don't use it in real time. Uh, so what we wanted is to see how you can take normal application and then you know, maybe transform it into microservice application if it's not already in microservice architecture, and then how you can scale it. Obviously, so many solutions exist for this type of um, uh, challenges, and essentially what we wanted is to move from, you know, the situation or challenge that you're trying to solve and into results. So also this uh, road is kind of like a roller coaster, so there are so many elements exist into this you know, straightforward task. So from packaging your application, so how do you package your application, and then how you can deploy it, and essentially also how you can scale it up and down, obviously with like average number of transactions you have in your application. So say for example, you have um, 1,000 transactions per second, and you want to scale this process, uh, essentially, you will end up with like average transactions per time frame. And essentially, all applications have some kind of spikes, right? So spikes can happen for various reasons. For example, Black Friday events or Christmas events, or if you have an online store and you want to you know, have some kind of offers or promotions. So you will, would expect to have maybe 10 times the average of your transactional uh, data. And you need some kind of load balancing because even the same microservice application that you use for your you know, average transaction application, you want to actually take it and make sure you balance it as well. Um, obviously, you need to monitor this type of applications in real time. So whatever happens in, for example, if you're using Java, for example, and using Java virtual machine, um, do you know how to monitor your application in real time? And if the answer is yes, how do you make sense out of this monitoring? So, for example, if you want to measure the heap size and you essentially want to scale your infrastructure, so how can you do it in real time? Um, obviously, redeployment is very critical uh, because it might you know, affect your end users. And what we're trying to do is kind of like redeploy the application, whether it's the same code or different code in real time without stopping this microservice application. So we want to switch between microservices based on whatever factors you have. So for example, if you're using some kind of machine learning models, if you want to switch between models and you want to do it without you know, taking this application down, you want to have some kind of free deployment in real time. So I mentioned real time, and real time means different things for different architecture, right? So for some architecture, it might affect like, I don't know, maybe yesterday's event or a few hours. Uh, for some applications, maybe a few weeks or a few months. So you look at your database and you see what type of transactions exist in, to, in database and then you do the analytics. Uh, for this talk, specifically what we mean by real time, we're talking about sub-milliseconds events. So, for example, give you some ideas here. So for an eye to blink, it takes about one third of a second. And if I ask you now, um, to go after this talk and write an application, um, even to measure this eye of playing, and even if you have the hardware in place, um, you might be able to do it for you know, small groups or maybe like a few hundred. 
uh, of people, but then if you want to scale it, if you want to take it to million transactions or million events or million blinks, um, it becomes really challenging to scale it because the scaling means you want to see what, what is the application is doing in terms of performance as well as how much data um, you use. Um, now, you might not need it for your work, obviously. It depends on type of use cases. So I always say, even if you don't use this type of application, you still uh, use it as end user. So for example, on your mobile or on your laptop, 90% um, of all applications you see, they use some kind of real-time stream processing um, capabilities. And obviously, uh, we see it in banks, for example, fraud detections or online payments. Uh, we see it with IoT devices, so smart devices, smart cars, they use some kind of real-time stream processing. Uh, medical devices, so hospitals, um, sports, for example, as well as machine learning. Um, so for machine learning specifically, I, I will show you some examples today, but obviously if you're not ma machine learning or a data scientist, uh, you probably don't know how to figure out the model. Uh, so you need someone to build up this model for you. And this is where the job between data scientists and essentially your job is, so how you can take this model and deploy it in real time. So um, let's just take a, a simple example here and let's just go through what, what we mean by this type of stream processing. So uh, what you see on the screen here is simple transaction. Um, whether it's your credit card or debit card, and you try to withdraw some money out of your bank account, um, you take this card, you swipe it, and then essentially, if it has some kind of you know pin code or whatever mechanism, it validates this and see, and the bank will decide whether to accept this transaction or not. Um, so it looks like a straightforward uh, process, so there is nothing wrong in or challenging in this process. So you see, you ingest the data, you do some kind of enrichment, so you add more data into the transaction, uh, you do some kind of data transformation, and then you do some kind of prediction. So this is where machine learning comes into place if you're using microservice machine learning in real time, and then that's the final act, right? So this is where you, you, your bank accepts or rejects your transaction. Um, now I explained it. It took me, I don't know, maybe one minute to explain it. Uh, but if you look at this, this type of um, you know, time window or time frame, what we're talking here is like under one second. So we're talking about sub-milliseconds. So it depends on the bank, obviously, and locations, and so many factors involved. Usually we look at SLA around 40 to 50 milliseconds. So that's pretty fast. And essentially, it depends how far your bank is from where you're trying to do this transaction. There are some elements which are kind of connected to the hardware. And it is hard to actually overcome these hardware challenges. So for example, network hoops, when you send this request, or input output as I will show you for the enrichment part. So what we're trying to do for the software architecture here is to minimize latency. Now, if we want to look at the data here, so for data ingestion, so this is exactly where you see it in JSON format, but could be in any format, it's not important. Um, so just to give you a rough idea what we are talking about, so some details related to your a credit card, for example, you see it. So for example, num credit card number so it appears on this where it, you can read it. Um, it depends also on which uh, mechanism you use to read or ingest your data. Uh, but this data alone is not enough, right? Um, it doesn't give you the full picture what we're trying to do for, you know, detect if there is a fraud in this transaction or not. We want to enrich it. And the enrichment part is connected to the actual credit card, but in this case, we don't take these details from the card itself. So we take it from maybe database or a file system where we store some information about the account holder. And the idea is to figure out if this transaction is valid or not. Now for the data transformation, so here what we're trying to do is to apply some kind of 
um, embeddings, for example, or if we're trying to do some kind of feature engineering, where we need to decide which feature from the real-time data, as well as which feature from the batch data or historical data we want to combine in order to decide we, what we want to feed into the machine learning model. After we do the transformation, here the prediction comes into place. Uh, so we want not only to use the machine learning model, but also to be able to switch between models, because models change over time. And if we look at a microserver, microservice architectures and we assume each microserver is responsible about a single machine learning model, uh, what we want is to be able to switch between models. Why do we need to do this in this specific critical area? Because data changes over time. So even trends in data change over time. And what could be valid machine learning model might not be valid after a few hours or a few days and so on. So we want to be able to do the deployment for machine learning microservice. And in, we need to do it in real time. So, once we figure out everything up to this stage, then the bank will decide, obviously, to accept the, the, your transaction or not. So keep in mind, this will take around, roughly around 50 milliseconds. Depends on the bank, obviously, and how far, and depends on the SLA bank implements. So the takeaway message from what you've seen on this screen is in, if you want to do it at scale, um, you need to combine two different types of data. Um, I would assume um, in this hall here, probably around 80 to 90 percent, they use historical data. So we use the, some database. We try to store data or transactions into database, and then we read it back again in the application. And once we read it, we do some kind of analytics. So the idea is to take it a step further in order to you know, minimize the latency and also provide some kind of real-time analytics uh, before we store the data um, into database. So let me repeat this again. Um, most of us here use batch data, where we ingest the data, we store it into database, and then we load it back into the application, and we do some kind of analytics on top of it. What we're saying today is, if you want to do real-time stream processing, you have to change this architecture. So you want to combine the real-time data, so this is as, as soon as you swipe your card, with the historical data in order to do the same stream processing um, application for real-time microservices. So the difference between these two different types is we process the data before we store it into database. So we want to be able to process the data as soon as we ingest it into our database. Obviously, now the question becomes why it is important and what you can get out of it. It depends how much data. And for this type of applications, we're talking about millions of transactions per second or even billion transactions per second. Um, some applications you've seen it online, for example, they use even 10 times more. And the way to actually predict or you know, find some kind of trends or alerts, we want to do it in real time. But in order to do it, we have to actually enrich this data. And because we're talking about two different types of data, so I will just mention that in order to you know, provide this type of solution, you want to combine two platforms or two packages into your Java application. So on one side, you need stream processing engine. So for example, this could be Kafka, or could be KSQL, or could be Kinesis, or Red Panda. And on the other side, you want fast data storage. So the fast data storage allows you to load the data into memory. So similar to the previous talk, so caching, you want to actually ingest it and put it into memory grid. And then you want to combine between these two different platforms. And if you are a developer and your manager or you know, your boss says, like, I want to create this type of application, and essentially you, you have to come up with the solution. 
Uh, obviously, uh, using multiple tools will affect you know, development time, maintenance time, and also the cost time. So what we're saying here is we want to be able to do this type of process and minimize latency. So this brings us to the solution for this talk today. And essentially, this is the Hazelcast platform, which is built on the Java virtual machine. So it's built on GVM, and it's open source. So you should be able to try out this demo today after we finish this talk. So on the left side, what you see is your sources. And in most cases, you need to combine multiple sources at the same time. Uh, so this could be Kafka topic, for example. It could be Apache Pulsar, or it could be IoT device or it could be enterprise application, or even a database. And once you ingest your data, you have two different components. So the first component is the JIT, or stream processing. So this is what we do in order to process the data in real time. And then we have the memory grid, which allows you also to do or load your data from, from database into cache in order to actually minimize latency. We want to combine between two different types and of data, obviously. And at the same time, you want your Java code to access both, uh, both data types at the same time and hopefully at the same speed. Uh, remember, the real-time data is faster, obviously. So you want to make sure uh, whatever configuration you use for this is to match the speed between the historical data or batch data with the right real-time data. And obviously, once you do the stream processing and data enrichment, you can proceed to send it to some kind of thing. So for example, you can send it back to some kind of app, uh, Apache Kafka topic or Apache Pulsar, or even you send it to end user. So it's a pretty straightforward when it comes to producing results. And the key is to simplify this architecture. Now, if I ask you, if you forget everything I talked about today, and if I ask you now to take your application and scale it, so it doesn't have to be even real time. So for some of you, scaling means you need to scale compute, so the process or your Java code. And for some, might be related to scaling your data. And the right answer is basically a combination between the two. It's not the data or the compute. What you need is to do this at the same time, so the combination between data as well as compute. And this is very important to make sure that whatever microservice architecture you use to store the relevant microservice as close as possible to your data centers. Um, so for example, Today, we're here in Sofia, for example, and we have data center for microservice one. And then back in the UK, we have different data center for microservice two. And we have two different Kafka topics, or two Kafka servers. Um, and then we have two instances, or two nodes in your, um, or two clusters. What you want is to make sure to have the data as close as possible to your microservice. So data relevant to microservice one, should be as close as possible to the, the um, location of this data center, and same thing for the data center two and microservice two. Um, the idea of having compute, computation aware or partition aware for compute as well as data is to make sure to minimize latency. Now, once we move to the microservice architecture, obviously we need to understand how you can build this type of application. So um, if you use Kafka, for example, the idea here is to use multiple microservices for multiple topics in Kafka. And essentially, if you're using machine learning, it doesn't have to be machine learning architecture. You use multiple models at the same time you need to access some kind of Python code, because that's where most machine learning models are written with. And obviously, you need also to integrate Python process into your application. Now, this is very important, because like now, we're moving away from the Java virtual machine. We're trying to use the Python virtual machine, and we want to actually run it inside the container. 
Now, why we need a microservice architecture for this type of application? Um, th these are like you know some you know introduction why you need to use microservice. Obviously, um, so you need basically it's easier to build microservice. So if you have multiple teams and then you have multiple different um, services or tasks, you can split it into smaller parts. It becomes easier to deploy, as I mentioned. So if you have multiple microservices, you can store the relevant microservice as close as possible to your data center. And then also easier to maintain, obviously, when it comes to redeployment. And of course, if you want to do some kind of scaling, as I will show you. Um, the key, again, not only to minimize latency, but also to focus on how you can do it and in very simple way. So these are two different types of architecture. You see it here. So one way is just like normal standalone monolithic application where you go task by task. So if it is Java code, for example, you have, I don't know, 10 tasks and you go you know, task by task. So this is good, but it, if you want to be able to do it in distributed fashion at scale, uh, probably it's not a good idea to use the monolithic approach. You want to use the microservice where you connect different types or different microservices to different uh, microservices depends on the use case. So we move to something called DAG format. And essentially, the DAG format will allow you to reuse this data or you reuse these computes. And this is very important to do it in real time. Um, if you remember from ingesting your data, so for example, when you swipe your card, um, the application should read this data only once. Um, so for example, I've never seen that, like for example, when you swipe your card and you are asked to do it multiple times, obviously, because this will add latency. So, Ingesting the data, for example, is once. Now, if you want to use it in different parts of your application, obviously, you can send this microservice or you connect it to relevant microservices. Same thing for analytics or processing as well as you know, um, output or visualization. Now, how it works, um, it allows you to connect a microservice one to topic one, for example. So if I have transactions history coming in topic zero or topic one, I can send it to microservice one. If I have a weather forecast I, in topic two, I can send it to microservice two. If I have GPS coordinates, so for example, if I'm, I'm swiping my card here in Sofia, I want to make sure uh, my bank knows exactly where I'm going to say, just in case if someone is scanning this card back in the, the UK, they should uh, you know, decline this process. So GBS coordinates, for example, can be stored in different topics. And all these are working simultaneously. So they're working in parallel. On top of this, what is important is not the real-time data, but also the data objects. So for example, some data re relevant to my transactions history. So what type of transaction I did last week or last month, and at the same time, how you com combine between these different types of topics, for example, microservices and data objects. Now, the Python uh, part is very important. So um, is on the bottom left side is where you store your process. So I just mentioned Python here, but it could be Java as well. So the idea is to ingest once and do the processing at you know, multiple times. This will allow you to actually not only save time and minimize latency, but also to become more efficient when it comes to deployment. Before I proceed demo, I just want to highlight why this is important. So most applications um, that you have written up to this point, they use one input or multiple inputs, and then you provide process one, and then you get outcome. What we're saying is you need to combine multiple processes at the same time in order to provide some kind of composite output. And this will allow you to have multiple microservices having multiple outputs, and then you do the combination. Now, if you want to scale, which is what we're talking about today, so this is kind of like architecture that you need to use. So imagine this is your cluster. 
And you, in your cluster, you have your Kafka topic or your inputs. Then you have the platform, which is connected to real-time data, as well as your database. And then you load it into memory grid. So you load it. I will show you how you can do it. And then you connect the microservice or more, which is very important. So most applications you use on your mobile, they use multiple microservices. And when it comes to scale, you need just to determine how much data, obviously, in order to scale up or scale down. Now, when it comes to deployment, we have uh, different ways. So for today's demo, I will deploy it on my machine. So you will see the code. You see how it runs on here on this machine. But obviously, it depends on you know, how big your cluster is. So in this type of is host, uh, today demo is host, but you can use something called Edge or Sidecar, where you store your microservices application as close as possible to your node. Or most like online application, you see they use something called Farm, which is like, hey, I have a data center dedicated for compute and multiple microservices, and then I can use different architecture to scale. Now, in order to understand, I mentioned one credit card, right? So if I scan my card here, and I scan it in Germany after two hours, it should be accepted. If I do it again, but in, next time I do it in New York, there is no two-hour time frame. So obviously, it should be rejected. And we need to multiply it. So now we are talking about the scaling part. So if you take the average, how many flights per week? So we're talking about 250K trans, uh, uh, sorry, flights. And then you need to multiply it by number of passengers. And then on top of it, of course, you need to know exactly how many credit cards and so on. So in order to do this, I will show you the code. So we're using Kubernetes to do the scaling. And this type of application, we managed to run like 1 billion transactions per second. And this is just around 25 millisecond latency on just 45 nodes. Um, so the application you will see today, what you need, obviously, you need the infrastructure or the hardware. You can use AWS or Google Cloud, whatever cloud platform you want to use. Uh, but very important to focus on linear scaling when it comes to scale, So which means um, you just need to add more nodes as much as you need for your data. Now, for this type of latency, obviously, we need to fi fi figure out how you can do it. So another example is if you're running an online auction and you want to know basically most bids for X and how you can do it in Java, I will show you the code before we proceed the demo. So this is the code split into two parts. So the first part, essentially, the benchmark, if you want to do benchmark, and then, um, obviously, because oh, you're using Java, so we use a Java Lambda for this type of application where we split the code. We write the stream processing pipeline or JET pipeline, and then we need to define window. And this is very important. This is the difference between batch data and real-time data. Batch data, you know exactly how many transactions exist in your database, right? So you can do SQL query, and then you get the results. For real-time data, you don't know how much data, right? Because you know the start, for example, and most cases, you don't even. And you don't know the end. So what you can do is to apply a window on your data. So the window, essentially, exactly, I want a slice of my data. So I take the stream. I take slice of it, and then I move this slice based on you know, whatever mechanism you want. So you can do it based on time. You can do it based on how many events, and so on. And then you can actually do the aggregation for your microservice. Now, I know that the question is, how can you set it up? So because that's what we are here for, right? Um, so the setup is straightforward. So what we're trying to do is run the Hazelcast instance on locally. So I'm running it on my machine. Obviously, I'm using um, one cluster, but it depends that I showed you how you can use Kubernetes to scale it. For example, 45 nodes in order to do 1 billion transactions. So you can 
roughly estimates how much you need. So for example, if I want to run, uh, I don't know, 4 billion transactions per second, you use exactly the same setup on maybe 45 times 4, it's around 180. So that's how you do it. I need to ingest the data, so I'm using Kafka. And in Kafka, it's just to send this data. So um, I'm not going to talk about Kafka here. It's essentially just how you can read the data in real time into your application. So let's just move quickly to the actual code. So because it's Java um, application, so what you see here is the POM file. So what I'm saying is, um, I just need to import this library or the jar file into my application. So exactly, this is exactly what you need to do. And it's essentially how much um, processing you need. Obviously, this is where the configuration comes into place. But I, I'm just specifying the library. I have two classes here. So one class is to publish the data, send it to the application. So I'm using Kafka producer. Obviously, I'm just creating events. And from here, I need to specify the server, so the IP address and port. As soon as I specify, I can proceed to the actual code, so in order to create the pipeline. So the pipeline will read from Kafka. So this is where you read your events. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's Java Lambda architecture. So hopefully, um, um, you know how it works. So in one part, I'm specifying the window. And then on the other part, I'm specifying the sliding pie, so how much I want to include in each, uh, each, uh, in each window. Uh, I'm doing aggregations. I want to know how many events I'm receiving per second and simply how you want to output or produce the results. So let's run this application. So from here, uh, I just need, uh, obviously, I have um, Kafka running. So this part here um, is the zookeeper as well as the server. And from here, if I start publishing the data, you can see now this application starts to generate the data, right? So these events, you see it. Obviously, um, in order to see what's going on, I want to make sure that my main application, sorry, uh, my publish publisher application has some kind of latency. The latency, I'm adding 20 milliseconds here just to you know, reflect the real life uh, scenarios. So where you swipe your card, for example, exactly there is some kind of hardware delay. And from if I run now the main class, what you see is the number of transactions. So if I just increase this size here, so these events, you see it here. So I'm receiving 4, 3, 10, and so on. So this is where you see the changes. So um, every, every, for every second, the application is calculating how many events I'm receiving. Obviously, this is the counting part. Now, the question is, what does it mean, right? Because you're actually processing the data, and then basically you just know how many transactions you're receiving per second. Um, this is just half of the picture, right? What we wanted is to take this into advanced steps. So we want to be able to enrich these events. Now, in order to reach, uh, enrich these events, we need to change the architecture. So in order to do this, I, I'll keep it running, and then I move back to the actual code. So what we saw up to this point is we actually have some data coming in real time in Kafka. We ingest it to the application and the Java virtual machine, of, your, of course, the Java application process these events, but I want to do it uh, in real time to provide context. So I want to enrich the data here. So data enrichment should be coming from different source. So this is not the real time uh, data, it's basically the batch data. Once I have it into, in, into the actual application, I store it in map or IMAP uh, structure. So it's basically a map structure, so key value pair. And once I have 
this data stored, I end up with having two different structures in my application. So I have the real-time data stored in one map, and then I have different map to store the batch data. And I want to do the enrichment. I want to do this combination in order to understand what's going on. So these events you've seen coming in real time, what we wanted is to say, I want to know, for example, when an activity or if event is a fraud or not. And I'm using a different coloring scheme. So for example, red, green, blue. Uh, and this is where the enrichment comes into place. So if I have red, I want to flag it. Um, and then you can proceed to do the alerts. Um, obviously, if you want to actually do the enrichment, what you also want is to make sure to when you do the combination between the batch data as well as the real-time data is to figure out which is belong to which. And in here, you end up with a third map or third eye map. So this is where you store not only the real-time data, but also the context. So if I move back again, uh, here I have Hazelcast instance running. So let's just uh, go. Obviously, it depends on how many clusters you want to define and how many nodes. And obviously, in my case, I'm using the local host. So I'm deploying it locally. And you see here from this screen, I have one cluster. And this one cluster has one node. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to scale, what you just need is, for example, if you're using Kubernetes to do the scaling, is just to define how many nodes and then you define hosts on top of it. So I will leave this running here. And now let's just do the enrichment. So the enrichment part, um, now we need just to move slightly to you know, machine learning side just to you know, show how you can do it in real time. Because what I'm about to do is not the actual Java code. Um, so in order, obviously, to run the Java code, you have to compile. You can do so. So everything I mentioned from this point, you can do it in Java. But if you're doing some kind of real-time stream processing microservice application, you probably want to run it in real time, which means you need to use some kind of SQL. So let's just do it in SQL. But as I mentioned, you can do it in Java, and then you have to um, switch between different cluster nodes. So here, um, I just need to create this map. So this SQL code, you see it on screen, will generate exactly the data or first part of the data. So now if I, now I'm running the SQL as you see it here. So this is the SQL command or SQL screen and this runs on top of your Java application. So let's just, post, uh, let's just see what happens when we post this data here. So this should be um, a command to create this streaming into or order to create this map and store it in, into memory. Now, if I want to you know, select from orders, for example, I just want to specify one specific user. Now, suddenly, you start to see events or orders coming in real time here. So um, it's very important to understand what you see on the screen is not coming from a database. So it's coming exactly from the real time or streaming engine you're using. Now, this is obviously running into memory. Now, obviously, it's just half of the story, right? So what does it mean if it is just one single user with a specific amount doing this transaction with a specific number of orders based on how many items? So I'm just going to stop this. Now, it's still running, by the way. So if I run it again, just, just show you again here. So this process is still running. but. And instead of using different screen to do different command, which I want to do, I'm just going to stop it here just to simplify my screen. Now I want to do this enrichment. Now, in order to do this enrichment, I want to create a different map. So the different map will have contextual data or batch data. 
And it's essentially a key value pair. So from here, again, I'm just doing it in SQL because that's how it's supposed to be if you want to run it in real time. Um, again, you can write it in Java, exact same SQL command. And if I run it now, now I have two maps in memory. One map has the streaming data, and the second map up to this point is empty, which I wanted to use for the data enrichment. Uh, let's just put some data into it. Um, if, if you've seen this today or yesterday, you probably uh, seen uh, or you probably saw, um, you know, the application running in IntelliJ and then the presenter or speaker running the application in order to actually uh, have some data in the application. Now, what you, you currently see different is the application is already running. So I'm creating a new map structure. I'm adding data into it. So this data now is stored in the second map. Now, the red, blue, green, let me increase the font size a little bit. So the red, blue, green is just a mechanism to, you know, to label my data. Um, it could be anything, to be honest. It could be, for example, your credit score or GPS coordinates or weather data. Um, the idea or the goal here is to provide some context to your application in order to decide why this is a fraud, why it is not. And not only it is important to decide which activity is not fraud, so it should be valid, but also to avoid false positives. So those who from data science background or you know, doing some machine learning, uh, false positive is pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, you're trying to use your card, but your bank declines it. So um, essentially, it's a valid transaction, but for whatever reason, your bank decided to decline. So again, we're not only trying to detect a fraud, but also minimize false positives. So that's the goal here. <laughs> so I'm using a coloring scheme, so I want to know if I have alerts and in second extra, so second step is exactly the red, I want to do the alert. So the code here is to define um, extra one, extra two, extra three as contextual data. And from here, I just specify I want to check when there is a red in second place. Now, if I put it, now let's just recap. I have streaming data stored in map. So every time you generate the data, obviously you start in the map and then you add context to it. So from this context, um, we're trying now to see what happens. So between the previous screen, um, maybe it's better just to go back again. Um, so I just wanted to do this comment again just to tell you why context in real-time applications is important. So let's just quickly clear this here. So I j I'm going to run this first comment, so which has only users and some um, uh, amount. Okay, so let's just go back here. So this is just one user, so for example, um, it could be anything from the streaming data. And from here, you see the stream. So again, um, it's not uh, you know, enough. It's not only uh, possible to do the fraud detection if I want to on this data. Now, after I created the second map and I inserted some data, now let's just run this command to see what the difference. And suddenly, you start to see two different types at the same time in real time. And remember, these two data types are stored into memory and even before you store it into database. So you have, for example, users. You have data coming into amounts. You have some kind of parameters you want to do or use for data enrichment. Obviously, in my case, I'm saying when it is only red 
in the second parameter, flag it, and from there, basically do the alerts. So with that being said, let's just go back quickly. Just to summarize the um, takeaway messages here. So if you want to create a real-time application, if you want to move from 4.9s to 5.9, so from 99.9, uh, to 5.9, to 99.999, you need to combine multiple data sources. Uh, some data types come in real time. Uh, other data types come from batch data or data stored into your database. And based on these two different types, you want to ingest it into one platform. Obviously, the solution would require to use one or more tools. In most cases, you require two or more. And if that's the case, you will end up with you know, two times more development time as well as maintenance, maintenance time. Um, the simplified way to do it is to use one platform in order to have ingestion, data ingestion from real-time data as well as batch data stored into memory grid. Once you have all the pieces in one place, you should be able to do this data enrichment even be actually storing it into database with like sub milliseconds latency. In order to scale it, in order to run it on, I don't know, one billion transaction with like maybe 20 milliseconds latency, you want to be able to scale it without changing the application. And the microservice should be stored as close as to possible to your data centers where your data is. And then from there, once you, come, once you have figured out all the pieces, you can proceed to have multiple microservices as output. So you can simply combine in order to get the composite output. If you find this um, content is useful and you want to try it out, um, there is a Slack community for this type of work. Uh, so feel free to scan this QR code. And from there, you should be able to use use cases. So I will stay ar around outside. If you have a dedicated use case for real-time scene processing or microservice, you want um, some, to have some discussion about it. And with that being said, thanks very much for attending this call. Thank you.